Shields up, Ironbreakers. Welcome back to Monster Hunter, and today we're going to be tackling the topic of Monster Hunter World versus Monster Hunter Rise. Now, this is a topic that we as a community have tackled plenty of times in the last couple of years due to the increase in popularity of the Monster Hunter franchise and just how different these two Monster Hunter games have been. Now, the reason why I decided to tackle this subject yet again is because recently Capcom has been running a campaign which they are naming Return to World. Now, this is an incentive campaign to get the old community back into Monster Hunter World with a fresh save, while at the same time also having a deep discount in both Monster Hunter World as well as Monster Hunter Rise to get new players into the franchise in preparation for the release of the new upcoming title Monster Hunter Wilds in 2025. Now, this has ignited the age-old debate, and I say age-old even though, you know, Monster Hunter World released in 2018, so it's not really that old, although, come to think of it, it's been like five years. Crap. Dude, time just goes by like that. But anyway, you know, it's it's ignited that debate of like, oh, World is way better than Rise, or Rise is way better than World, depending on which side of the community you stand. And uh, some people have even come out of the woodwork saying that Rise is a bad game, and they've said as much over, you know, after having played Rise. And look, I understand that these are two fundamentally different games, even though they're essentially the same franchise, they do tend to serve a different audience. So today, I figured we'd go over the different features that each of these games has, and then we'll figure out which one is, objectively, the better game. So, let's jump into it, shall we? One of the first things that you are going to notice by looking at the gameplay here on the left, which is the gameplay of Monster Hunter World, and the gameplay here on the right, which is of Monster Hunter Rise, is that naturally World features more realistic visuals, whereas Rise features a little bit more stylized visuals. Now, where you stand in the field with this particular feature is going to depend on your own personal preference. Now, a lot of players are going to just stand more on the side of hyper-realistic visuals, you know, higher resolution resolution, all of that stuff. Now, do keep in mind that the footage that I am showing here is from the Nintendo Switch. The game is also available on PlayStation 5 as well as uh, PC and Xbox. So the visuals in Rise are actually significantly better than what we're seeing in this video. But still, for the purpose of, uh, of our discussion, I think that this is a good illustration of what Monster Hunter Rise looks like. Now, whether you prefer the more hyper-realistic look of Monster Hunter World to the left or the st more stylized uh, style of Monster Hunter Rise is going to depend on the type of gamer that you are and how much you actually care about visuals. But the interesting thing is that when it comes to my personal preference, I feel like there's good aspects in both of these visuals. Now, I already know that a lot of players are going to say, oh, come on, Rurikon, Monster Hunter World clearly looks better than Monster Hunter Rise. And the reality is, I don't necessarily agree with that statement. I think that from a visual fidelity standpoint, Monster Hunter World is clearly superior. Yes, this, this is correct. The textures are more detailed and all of that jazz. But from an artistic standpoint, I actually think that these two games are a lot closer than people give them credit for. Now, naturally, you look at the vistas in Monster Hunter World, and it's very easy to say, oh, this is a more beautiful game. But if you look, for instance, at some of the armor sets and even some of the weapon designs in Monster Hunter World, there are definitely some things that have been done better in Monster Hunter Rise. So in this first point, I feel like... A lot of this is going to be about your own personal preference, even if I do believe that a majority of the community is going to lean more towards Monster Hunter World. And, you know, I personally tend to lean more towards Monster Hunter World myself, but that's not to say that World just looks better than Rise and that's the end of the discussion, because I also think that Rise looks absolutely phenomenal. And you need to keep in mind that Rise was designed as a portable game to run on the Nintendo Switch. And what they've been able to achieve with the RE engine for this game to run on the Nintendo Switch with the level of visual detail, the size of the maps, and how fast past the action gets is nothing short of an absolute technical feat. So, in this case, more of a personal preference type of thing. I like both. 
and I particularly like some of the weapon designs in Rise much more than I like some of the weapons designs in Worlds, but when it comes to maps, I prefer the maps of Monster Hunter World over the maps of Monster Hunter Rise. But like I said, there's space in both of these, and it's not a black and white discussion. But feel free to disagree and let me know in the comment section down below. Then if we look at the zones, the maps wherein we uh, do combat, I would argue most definitely that Monster Hunter World has larger, more intricate zones, whereas Monster Hunter Rise has simpler zone design. Even though in a lot of these maps we actually see a high degree of verticality, you know, even though I say simpler zones, this doesn't mean that these maps don't have their own complexities, but most definitely when you're jumping into a hunt in Monster Hunter Rise, you are going to be getting to the monster faster, you are going to be engaging in combat faster, and you're not really going to be paying as much attention to the detail around you that you have in these maps. You're also not going to be really interacting with the environment as much as you do in Monster Hunter World because you have like the falling rocks in the ancient forest and you have plenty of other features that work as like traps for the monsters and you also have some of those in Monster Hunter Rise but not really to the same extent. So larger, more complex, more intricate zones versus the more simpler zones of Rise. If I had to choose here, I would definitely go with Monster Hunter World when it comes to the map design. That is because I value immersion more than I value faster hunts. But I believe that a significant portion of the community will actually prefer the more arcade style of the zones in Monster Hunter Rise because it allows them to get their hunts faster, which again is important and more relevant due to the fact that Monster Hunter Rise is fundamentally a game designed for portability. So keep that in mind, you know, faster jumping into the game, getting into the action. Now we have uh, another comparison here, which is related to the tracking of the monster. In Monster Hunter World, we have scout fly tracking. So this is something that actually required you to interact with the map to a certain extent, even though this was mostly during the beginning of the game. Because as you get further on to the, uh, you know, to the, the more end game zone of Monster Hunter World, eventually the scout flies will always know exactly where the monster is. So there's um, there's kind of like throughout the first 60 to 70% of the game, there is a tracking aspect where you're going through the game and you're actually tracking the monster, which is good. But towards the latter half of the game, usually you will know exactly where the monster is by the time you jump into the map. That's just the way that these things go. The more you hunt the monsters, the more knowledgeable you'll become. And eventually the monster is just always present on the map. Uh, whereas in Monster Hunter Rise, there never is any form of tracking system whatsoever. We have what I dubbed the Kahoot Sonar system. You have a Kahoot, which for those of you that didn't play Monster Hunter Rise, is this owl-looking creature that just instantly tells you exactly where every monster is in the map, uh, you know, what monster it is. It doesn't just tell you the location, it tells you exactly what monster it is, it tells you if the monster is enraged or not. It, it gives you all of the possible details that you could ever want about every single thing that is on the map at any given time without any tracking whatsoever. This is one of those things where, again, it is designed for the portability aspect. So if you're, you know, let's say you're in a train station or something, you're waiting for a train, you're trying to get a hunt in, it's more convenient. Way less immersive, but more convenient. I feel like, again, this is gonna be towards personal preference, depending on the type of gamer that you are. If you're a gamer that's on the go, you're probably gonna lean more towards Monster Hunter Rise. If you're the type of person that is playing in your house, in your couch, Monster Hunter World is much better, much more immersive. Now me, usually I play on my couch more so than I play portably, uh, so Monster Hunter World tends to be my own personal preference, and I know we've gone really deep into more Monster Hunter World, things are not looking too good for Rise. Now, next up, if we talk about the combat, the simpler way to describe the combat of both games, I feel like is going to be in Monster Hunter World, you have a combat that is simpler. I mean, objectively, the weapon combos in Monster Hunter World are less complex than the weapon combos in Monster Hunter Rise for the most part. This is probably not true for every single weapon, but for the most part, it is simpler to play weapons in Monster Hunter World than it is to play them in Monster Hunter Rise. The pacing of the combat is also slower. 
more deliberate. There's more of the dance with the monster than there is in Monster Hunter uh, Rise because Monster Hunter Rise gives you a lot more tools to escape the monster, it gives you a lot more tools to kind of like brute force the monster itself, just beat the crap out of it as fast as you possibly can and absolutely destroy it. So I would classify Monster Hunter World as simpler, slower, more deliberate combat, and I would argue that Monster Hunter uh, Rise and Sunbreak is more complex, much more fast-paced, and much more arcadey. Again, if you notice, there's a bit of a theme going on wherein where there's a faster-paced combat, which is, you know, the more complex part is uh, a little bit weird from a portability standpoint because you could argue that, you know, it, it's a portable title. You maybe want it to also be simpler, but at the same time, having a more complex playstyle that allows you to brutally combo monsters even harder also leads to a much faster experience which is again something that is advantageous if you are playing on the go you get some faster hunts again this is going to depend on the type of player that you are if you're the type of technical player that likes to you know style on monsters and stuff like that i feel like rise and sunbreak are definitely going to be more your speed because it's much closer to something like a devil may cry whereas monster hunter world is much slower and let me like move this a little bit more forward so that we can actually watch gameplay instead of cutscenes. uh now me personally as a gamer i prefer the simpler slower deliberate combat i feel like there's a certain elegance to the simplicity of it all but I also loved the crap out of playing Rise. I think the situation here, and as a matter of fact, I would argue that Rise Gunlance is the best that Gunlance has ever been. Uh, Rise Sunbreak Gunlance, it is a ton of fun. They've put a lot of really cool moves into the Gunlance. Uh, whereas in World, the Gunlance is much, much, much more limited, even with the introduction of the Iceborne moveset. But interestingly enough, I can also give you an example that is the exact opposite. Wherein, if you look at the Charge Blade in Rise Sunbreak and you compare it to the Charge Blade in Monster Hunter World, I don't know if everybody feels the same way I do, but give me Monster Hunter World Charge Blade any day of the week over the Charge Blade in Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. That's not to say that it was bad, it's just to say that for my own personal preference, I liked the Charge Blade in World much, much more, and it felt like a much better weapon than it did in uh, Rise Sunbreak. Even though there's a couple of moves like the aerial file discharge, which I forget exactly what the name of that thing is, but the one where you go up into the air and then you discharge a file. Uh, it was like was it like the moon salt slash? Or I, I forget the name. There was one one of the slashes that you did where he kind of like slashes upwards, the rising slash, whatever, and then you followed it up with a file explosion. I love that move. I would <laughs> that move was brutal. I loved it. I thought it was awesome. But you know. Fundamentally, there's definitely examples here where I like one weapon over the other, depending on which version of the game we are talking about, which just goes to show that it's more of a personal preference thing. But overall, I like slower, more deliberate combat. This is something that I've not made any secret or anything like that. And uh, yeah, so for this one, I would choose World. Now, for the next one, in keeping up with the combat theme, we have uh, what some people commonly refer to, okay, what's the gimmick of this Monster Hunter game, right? So in World, I would say, okay, the gimmick is the Slinger, the Clutch Claw, even though potentially you would even add in here like the map traps and whatnot, the, the amount of map traps that we have in World is really good. But Slinger and Clutch Claw, let's keep things simple. And then when it comes to Rise, Sunbreak, the... The thing that I would compare that to would be wire bugs, switch skills, swap, swap scrolls, and silk bind arts. So plenty of more stuff on the side of Monster Hunter Rise. Now when it comes to my preference, it's like, look, in World, the Slinger, I thought, perfect. I like the Slinger. Slinger is cool. Slinger is fun. Happy fun times. Clutch Claw, on the other hand, I felt took things a little bit too far. And the reasoning is obviously wall banging, tenderizing. But in my specific case, it was also because you needed to use the Clutch Claw to extract ammunition from the monster, which you would then load into your gun land so that you can put a Wyvern Stake Blast on it. And then it, it just added way too many, uh, way too much maintenance to a weapon that already has a ton of maintenance built in by default. And it made, in my opinion, for 
a not as good experience when it came to the Gunlance, the the introduction of the Clutch Claw. And I know that a lot of people have complaints about the Clutch Claw, which I understand, but we all have to admit it was pretty cool the very first time that we wall banged the monster. And we'll we'll talk more about that in the next section. Now, when it comes to Monster Hunter Rise and Sunbreak, I love the wire bugs. I think wire bugs are really fun, but at the same time, I think wire bugs are incredibly arcadey. And if I had my way, people always ask me, if you could change one thing about Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak, what would you change? And the thing that I always go back to is I would remove Wirefall. I think Wirefall was way too powerful. For those of you who don't know what Wirefall is, it was a recovery that you could do with wire bugs, wherein whenever a monster would send you flying, you would be able to press, I don't know, left trigger plus B or something, left trigger plus X, I, I forget. But there was a combination that you would uh, press. I'm sure that if I was to do it right now, I would instantly do it by instinct. But I just, because like I know instinctually the buttons, but I don't remember the actual, whatever. You guys get the idea. Uh, and basically you're able to recover from whenever a monster sends you flying. And I felt like that's too much. That is too much. It is too easy to recover. It is even easy to recover and then counter after being sent flying. And I was like, okay, that's that's too much. I don't think the hunter should be given that type of power. Because one of the things that ended up happening in Monster Hunter Rise was to compensate for all of this mobility, a lot of the monsters were basically uh, acting like if they were on crack cocaine with paranoid delusions and bipolarism, okay? Monsters would just go completely and absolutely wild on you. They would rampage on you and just be hyper super fast to the point where sometimes you, I would have situations like, okay, the monster is just thrashing about. Uh, I think I'm just going to go take a break over there in this different zone. And then I'll just wait it out until the monster chills. And then I'll come back and I'll beat the crap out of the monster, right? That's the thing. Or sometimes you could just brute force through it, depending on which monster you're talking about. But, you know, that's kind of how they countered that. So in a lot of ways, I prefer wire bugs over clutch claw because wire bugs didn't require you to tenderize. They didn't require you to clutch on all the time. They didn't require you to, to do a lot of things. But at the same time, wire bugs enabled something called wyvern riding, which we're going to be talking about a little bit further ahead. So there's a back and forth in here. Then we also have switch skills. Now I'm a big proponent of switch skills. I like weapon movesets evolving as you play throughout the game, even though it was actually surprising to me that a lot of people in the community are not as keen on switch skills as I am, which is perfectly fine. Every person has their own preference. But me personally, out of all of these things, switch skills would be the one thing that I would like Monster Hunter to keep. Swap scrolls, I think, go way too far. Because swap scrolls, you can just like have completely different movesets in the same weapon in a combat situation, which is one of those things that even though I say they go too far, I'm, ha I'm happy they did it. And we'll talk more about that after we go through all of these uh, different, uh, all of these different features that each of the game has so that you guys can understand where I'm coming from. But I still appreciate them. Silkbind Arts is one of those things where I also feel they go a little bit too far. There's a lot of really crazy stuff that you could do with Silkbind Arts, like... The most uh, abusive example that I can give you is Bullet Barrage, where you just like jump into the mon- you blast dash into the monster and unload your full gun lance payload in one fell swoop, including Wyvern Fire, full burst, Wyvern Stake, all of the things. Brutally satisfying, incredibly arcadey, and not necessarily something that I would like to see in the next Monster Hunter game. However, it would be something that I would like to see make a return in the game after the next Monster Hunter game. So when it comes to this one, I don't really have a clear preference between all of the features that are, uh, you know, all of the features that go for each of the Monster Hunter games. It's like, I like the Slinger. Slinger is cool. I'm not the biggest fan of Clutch Claw. Clutch Claw was too much. Wire bugs are cool, but they're also a bit too much. And I don't like Wirefall. Switch kills is like the best thing out of all of these things here for me. Uh, swap scrolls, cool, but not something that I want to see in the next Monster Hunter, but maybe the one after that. Silkbind Arts, same thing as scrolls. So to me, it's like, give me switch skills, give me slinger, and get rid of everything else. <laughs> next up, we have uh, what I like to call the monster controlling feature. So in Monster Hunter World, you have traditional mounting and wall banging. And in Monster Hunter Rise, you have Wyvern Riding. Now look, 
Wyvern riding is something that is really cool when you do it the first like five times. It's like, oh my God, this is so amazing. Then you realize this is so brutally overpowered. And on top of it, it actually makes it an advantage whenever two monsters uh, go into the same zone. Whereas in previous Monster Hunter games, whenever two monsters would be in the same zone, it would be so annoying that some players would go and resort to having literal shit in their bags to throw at the monsters. Yes, I know, it's a disgusting practice. We don't do here in this channel. We don't use dung, dung pods. That's just something that we don't do. At least not since Monster Hunter World, because if you take me back to GU, you better believe I'm probably going to, be, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to resort to using dung pods. I'm not proud of it, but in GU, that is just like something that you kind of need, right? But anyway, as I was saying, the Wyvern riding was just a plus on every aspect whenever it came to advantages in hunting. And it, it made it so that you would never fear when two monsters were in the same zone. As a matter of fact, if you were just looking to finish the hunt as fast as possible, two monsters coming to the same zone was seen as an advantage. And this is the only game where that would be seen as an advantage. I know that I personally liked seeing it in Monster Hunter World, but there's no real hunting advantage to having two monsters in the same zone. Like, they'll hurt each other a little bit. If they trigger a turf war, that's great. But if their turf war is on cooldown, yeah. So, Wyvern riding again, interesting feature. I would not want to see it come back, ever. Like, not even in the Monster Hunter after the next one. I don't want to see Wyvern riding again. I did not like it, uh, you know, after having... Like I said, it's one of those things, it's fun the first time, five times, and then you're like, okay, this is actually not a, a particularly good feature, and it's actually bad for the game. In my opinion, feel free to disagree or whatever, but it was one hell of a power fantasy. When it comes to worlds, uh, traditional mounting, I think, is really good. Uh, I like traditional mounting ever since 4 Ultimate. As a matter of fact, it was the reason why... And for ultimate, for a decent stint, I was actually maining Insect Glaive just so that I could control mounting easier, which is really cool. So traditional mounting, I like it. Even though they did a lot of improvements on mounting, this is not technically speaking traditional mounting, but it is the closest thing we have to traditional mounting in the fifth generation. Then the other thing we have is wall banging. See, wall banging was kind of like Wyvern riding, wherein it's fun, and oh, actually, it was a little bit better than Wyvern Riding. Like, I remember still enjoying wall banging long before the novelty of it wore off. I was still like, yeah, let's wall bang. But when you really think about wall banging, it was basically a situation wherein, okay, is the monster enraged? No, wall bang it. Is the monster enraged? Yes. Okay, just continue fighting like you normally would, you know? So... It was a situation that kind of very much restricted how you would hunt because you, even though people can say, well, you're not forced to do it, the ridiculous amount of advantages that you get from wall banging means that if you're trying to hunt optimally in any way, you're going to wall bang as often as you possibly can because it's pretty much free damage and you can wall bang monsters into each other, deal mass amounts of damage, wall bang them into walls, do all of these things. So. Wall banging I don't like, traditional mounting I like, wyvern riding I don't like. That's kind of where we stand with that. Then we have the helper category. We're in, in Monster Hunter World, you have Palicos. Uh, your Palico is customizable. You can change the abilities that he has by changing his gear and all of that stuff. And then in Monster Hunter Rise, Palicos are way more customizable. Uh, so you can really like make a Palico super your own with the set of skills that you want to give it and all of that stuff especially after sunbreak allowed you to fully customize your palico which is really cool you get to do a really cool palico and all of that but at the same time your palicos did not have wrath of meow which sucks why would you not give palicos wrath of meow i miss wrath of meow okay i want them pushing their little tank cart shooting rockets out of it that thing was awesome but in rise you also had palamutes and followers now when it comes to palamutes i think palamutes are awesome but i'm not the biggest fan of you using them to navigate the map even though that's definitely a feature that's coming back with monster hunter wilds because there was also an overpowered element to palamutes in my opinion which a lot of players disagree with me on this but the fact that you can just call your palamute ride it uh circle the monster around and be sharpening at the same time i'm like that's a bit much that's a bit much you too much utility but you know, 
Overall, I'm not particularly against Palamutes, but I think that they gave you maybe too much utility, and at the same time, I believe they also did the most damage for a significant uh, amount of time. Me, personally, I always played with two Palicos because I really enjoy the utility that Palicos bring to the table, and they also brought sort of a, a funny uh, moment to the hunts whenever they would, like, chain flash bomb a monster or something like that. It was cool. Followers, on the other hand, uh, is an interesting one. I like the concept of follower quests. I'm not sure that I enjoyed the fact that you could just bring followers into every quest and the quest didn't scale because fundamentally it's just like you make the quest way easier by using followers and that's pretty much it. Now I used followers a lot because of the way that anomalies work. Uh, which is anomalies were just grindy as all hell. So yeah, I would use followers to make things a little bit easier. But at the same time, I would rather the follower feature not to return in the same way that it was ultimately introduced to Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. That is to say, I liked followers in the beginning, wherein you have your own follower quests. So those quests are designed to be tackled with followers and you can balance around that. And you go on quests with the followers, I actually thought it was really cool because you get to know more about these characters that you interact with and the hub and all of that stuff. That was a big positive as far as I'm concerned, it was all good. But when you could just take them to every single quest, I personally felt like it was too much. So again, Palico's cool, Palamute's sure, maybe nerf them a little bit and the amount of uh, stuff that Palamute's can do was maybe a bit much. But then again, you could also do so much with Palico's that I'm not really going to complain too much about it. And followers, I would prefer stick to the way they were at the beginning of Sunbreak because I think that was better, but feel free to disagree with me in the comment section down below. Then, we have the feature that I recently did a poll in one of my live streams, and this broke the community right down the middle. Random decorations versus random charms. So, for those of you that... I mean, I'm assuming most of you watching this have played both games. If you didn't, in Monster Hunter World, uh, you would get random decorations in certain hunts. You could not craft decorations. You could meld decorations, which also had an RNG aspect to it. But fundamentally, de decorations would be random. So you're, you making your own build, you would have to get lucky with the decorations that you get throughout questing. And that's the way that it went. However, you could craft whatever charm you want. All of the charms were craftable which meant that that particular aspect of your build was not RNG. In Rise, it was the other way around, which is actually the way that it's always been in the series, I think, uh, which is your charms were random, so the skills that you would get on a charm was completely random, but you could craft your decorations. Now, when it comes to my personal preference on this topic, I think I prefer random charms, but at the same time, it's not like I have, uh, I feel like initially I had a much stronger position on it where it's like, no, only want charms. I never want to go back to decorations. And after thinking more and more about it, and particularly due to the fact that charms have received tremendous amounts of power creep, wherein charms by the end of Rise Sunbreak were so much more powerful than they were at the beginning, that I feel like, I don't know, man, the RNG on these charms is getting pretty friggin' wild. Like, getting a god charm became pretty much build-defining. So, in a way, I still lean more towards random charms, but if you were to tell me that the next one's gonna have random decorations, I'm like, eh, you know, it's not as big of a deal for me anymore. I remember that at the beginning of Rise, I was like, oh, yes, random charms, so much better than random decorations. I never want to go back to random decorations again. But over time, I'm much more neutral on it. I still prefer, again, random charms, but if they give me random decos, I think it'll be fine. Now, this is something that I will criticize a whole lot, and I know that a lot of people uh, have disagreements with me when it comes to this. Monster Hunter World had tremendous skill bloat and power creep, which is something that I didn't like. And this is something that me and Gaijin talk in more detail, in the recent, uh, I don't know if this is going to come out before or after episode 81 of the Third Fleet Podcast. So, but me and Gaijin go much more in depth into this in episode 81 of Third Fleet Podcast. So if you're curious, you can watch that. But basically, both games feature tremendous skill bloat and power creep with um, Rise Sunbreak being the worst offender when it comes to that type of stuff. So... 
this is just to me it's just like a negative on both games as far as i'm concerned i want to go back to a time where we didn't have as much skills i think we have too many skills i think there are very few drawbacks to you know getting full max uh, attack boost full max critical eye full max wax full max critical like you know full max all of the raw damage skills i think there's not enough of a drawback to be able to do that where it used to be like in early it used to be like that in earlier games as a matter of fact i might do a, a video dedicated to talking about that for monster hunter wilds but this is one of the situations where i feel like both games lose and rise sunbreak just is even worse than world when it comes to this so you know then we have kolv taroth and safi weapons rng versus curious crafting rng I don't like too much RNG when it comes to this. I feel like Kulf to Roth was way too egregious, particularly because it locked for, for Gunlance mains will have felt the Kulf to Roth situation more than most other weapons, I feel like, because it locked a whole play style behind getting a specific, uh, I think it was like two Kulf to Roth weapons, which were the gun lances that would have shelling level four. And then later, uh, I don't remember if they did the same thing for Master Rank or not. But the point is, it was not a good thing, the RNG on Kulf. The RNG on Safi was much more forgivable because the pool of weapons was smaller. And there were like, I seem to remember there were mechanics for you to influence which weapon you would be getting. So that was much more acceptable. But at the same time, it was... Uh, it's still not the best when you have that level of RNG. But if you compare that to Curious Crafting RNG, give me Kulv and Safi put together any day of the week. Curious, R Curious Crafting RNG is something that I never want to see come back in any way, shape, or form. I hated it. There's nothing good about it. And every single time that I engaged in it, by the time that I was done, I didn't even feel like playing the game anymore because, I don't know, I just did not like that system at all. I know that a lot of people enjoyed it. That's perfectly fine if that is your, you know, that is your prerogative. Feel free to let me know in the comment sections if you liked it, but I feel like Curious Crafting was a net negative towards the game. Then we have uh, Tempered Monsters, Arch Tempered Monsters, and Black Dragons. I know that people like to question me about my pronunciation of Arch Tempered. That is the British pronunciation, my dudes. I know that in the US, y'all say Arch Tempered. In Britain, in King's English, they say arch-tempered. And I don't even have a dog in this race. I'm Portuguese, bro. I don't give a damn. But I'll say arch-tempered. But So, whatever. Tempered, arch-tempered, and black dragons versus apex anomaly monsters and EX monsters. I think I prefer what they've done with Monster Hunter World. Even though I really liked apex monsters, which are kind of like a callback to deviant monsters from Generations Ultimate. Uh, Anomaly Monsters, I think, was fun, but the Anomaly system itself, uh, I kind of, like, grew tired of because of how grindy it was. And EX Monsters, I can't even talk about them, because, like, EX Monsters, I'm talking about the, what was it called? The Anomaly Investigations Level 300 Monsters, like, you would unlock these things when you would reach Anomaly Level 300. I never got there because the grind was too much and I got bored. It would take too long to level up the anomaly stuff, so I never really got to the EX monsters. But I just think I prefer the approach that we had in Monster Hunter World uh, because it was, in a lot of ways, less grindy. But yeah, th I, I don't really have like too much strong feelings other than I don't want to go through another like 300 levels of... Uh, of anomaly investigations and all that stuff. Then we have siege events versus rampages. This, I feel like this is almost not a fair comparison, but I don't really have another way to compare this uh, feature wise because the community as a whole were, were not big fans of rampages, even though I'm like, rampage is a fun thing for you to zone out, play with a couple of friends, and just enjoy it for a little bit. But it's not something that I would go in and be like, oh yeah, let's do a rampage, kill like 100 monsters, right? Siege events, I feel like, are just straight up better. Like the siege events of Kul Taroth, Safi, Jiva, all of that jazz. I thought that that was awesome. I thought that was really cool. And they they were also very good to host. You know, like I would host a live stream. We'd all get together, do a bunch of siege events. It was fun times. It was really fun times. So 
I personally here just go straight towards siege events. I don't even consider Rampage. But like I said, I also feel like it's a bit of an unfair comparison, but I'd be curious to hear what you guys think about it. Now, let's talk about the investigations themselves because we had two different approaches to investigations wherein in Monster Hunter World, we had three tiers of tempered investigations. And in Sunbreak, we had 300 levels of anomaly, anomaly investigations. Say it with me, it was too much. I think it was too much. Give me the tempered investigations any day of the week. I had more fun with those than I did with anomaly investigations because they were less grindy and I would do them for fun more so than doing them because I wanted to progress to reach the, the pinnacle of difficulty and all of that. And I was never able to really reach that pinnacle because it was, it was just too grindy. But... Let me know how you guys feel about that, but I definitely prefer the world aspect there. Then we have seasonal events versus traditional events. So what does this mean? Well, in Monster Hunter World, we had the seasonal events, which is, you know, Capcom would be like, hey, we're bringing in this seasonal event during spring. Then during spring, you would have a bunch of events that would pop up and the community would kind of like rally up and we'd all show up to multiplayer hunts and you know, the lobbies would become more active with players to go in and engage on these seasonal events. However, there's definitely a negative side to it, wherein there is a limited time frame that you would have to access these events. Ever since the, uh, you know, ever since uh, Monster Hunter World went into, let's call it maintenance mode, which is like, there's no more updates, just enjoy the game, enjoy what you used to play. They basically have these seasonal events on a cycle. So they're constantly happening in the game now so that you know it's like what i don't know if it's one week with events and one week without or two weeks with events and two weeks without but it's kind of like that they're constantly cycling through the different event weeks and then you have some weeks where you don't have events and then another week there's a different event for you to be able to experience these with um you know with some degree of availability and then you have traditional events which is like you download them you play them and it's whatever and I know that for a lot of people, they're going to prefer the traditional events, but if I really think back to when I had the most fun, I think seasonal events were better. As a matter of fact, what happened with traditional events due to the fact that there wasn't that sense that like, oh, I got to do this event right now. In a lot of situations, I noticed that I would download the event quest and not even do it. I'd be like, oh, I have it. I'll do it later. But there's also an aspect of that that was driven by the fact that I ended up playing the game uh, in two different platforms. So first I played the game on the Nintendo Switch, then I played the game on PC, then I went back to the Nintendo Switch, and therefore I had to do uh, the same quests multiple times, and you know, just having to go back and do event quests on top of that ended up becoming uh, prohibitively due to the time investment that it required. But if I was to really get right down to it, I think I preferred seasonal events. I thought they were more fun. They brought the community together. It was really fun to do live streams around it. It was just a fun time all around. And if I had to choose between these, I would go for the seasonal events. Then we have 16 player lobbies versus four player lobbies. But with village multiplayer, that's the, the advantage of the four player lobbies. Uh, I think 16 player lobbies take the win. I don't think there's, I mean, there's more players. And as someone that streams the game, I had way more fun with 16 player lobbies. But, you know, if you feel differently, I think that's fine. I preferred 16 player lobbies. Then we have like the endemic life and immersion aspects of Monster Hunter World, which most definitely uh, focused much more on endemic life and being immersed versus the more arcadey play style and less focus on environment, which, like I say, to me, I prefer Monster Hunter World for, you know, the Monster Hunter World style of things for Monster Hunter Wilds, but for the game after Wilds, I think I'll also want it to be more arcadey and less focus on environment, which goes back to, I like the contrast that we get with these two game styles. So for the next game, because on the previous game we had arcade and less focus on environment, for the next game I want them to double down on the endemic life and immersion, because the contrast is what, <clears throat> what makes it really fun for me. And then finally, we have pre-hunt preparation versus spirit birds. Uh, I'm very much pro preparation. So the spirit bird aspect wasn't tremendously appealing for me. 
But at the same time, it wasn't too bothersome. You come up with your route to go through and get spirit birds fast. It's not even that big of a deal. And there's skills that diminish the amount of engagement that you have to do with it. So now that we've went through all of these features, and like I said, I probably missed a few of these. Like I said, bear with me because I was up late last night recording Third Fleet Podcast for you guys. So, you know, if I missed something, let me know in the comment section uh, what, it, what you feel that I missed. What was the feature that you liked more in World versus Rise? Let's have a discussion in the comment section about all this. But I tried to be as detailed as I possibly could. So now, which one is objectively the best game. They're both awesome. Yes, I made you sit through all of this and I'm not giving you an answer. At the end of the day, what I wanna see for the future of Monster Hunter is exactly what we got with these two titles. And that is to say the contrast. Because if you double down and you just have super immersive experience like Monster Hunter World, and then you have another one that's just like that again, you're eventually gonna grow bored of it. Whereas if you have an experience that is super immersive like Monster Hunter World, and then the next experience is much more arcadey like Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak, you get a contrast and things become fresh which is why I think it's a genius move from Capcom to promote the return to world stuff now because people are coming off of the arcade game and they're not ready to give them wilds yet, so they're going to give them world as kind of like a taster in between now and 2025 when we're gonna go back to the more old school style of Monster Hunter. And that is most likely why Monster Hunter World is, uh, you know, trending right now. And there's so many people jumping into live streams of Monster Hunter World and all of that jazz because we just had the more arcadey experience and the contrasting experience of Monster Hunter World feels great to jump back into. So at the end of the day, both games are awesome and I'll take both. I'll take Monster Hunter Wilds as a more immersive, slower, more deliberate combat experience and I'll take whatever is the next arcade experience that they're doing afterwards because it's going to be way more fun to just jump in and mess around with super fast weapons, crazy movesets, and all of these crazy experimentation things that they do for their more portable series. It's going to be good times for whatever Monster Hunter style you prefer. Anyway, happy holidays everyone. Hopefully this video was entertaining for you. If you enjoyed it, hit the like button, subscribe, bell notification icon, all of that jazz. And remember to check out the latest episode of Third Fleet Podcast. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong, stay safe. Happy New Year. Peace out.